Okay, so welcome to College Algebra. So we're going to do just a couple exercises uh, from last time. And then we'll move to something new. So today's the ninth. Oh, you can't see it. Okay, thank you. Really? Okay, now you can see it. Okay, that was weird. Okay, so today's the ninth. So, for example, I could say x squared plus 11x plus 30 divide by x squared plus 5x plus 6 and then multiply by uh, x squared plus 7x plus 12 over x squared plus 8x plus 16. Okay, and the instruction is simplify simplify by cancellation. Oh, and also, so simplify by cancellation, that's instruction two, and instruction one is find the natural domain. Okay, so how do we do it? Factor, right? In the end, this is what's necessary. So, so we were given four uh, quadratics. And what's convenient about, about all of them? They're all monic. So someone who didn't say monic, could, would you please remind us what monic is? What? The leading coefficient is one. Okay. So mathematicians have a special place in their heart for polynomials with leading coefficient one. So they have their own name, monic. Okay. So let's factor each one of them. The one in the top left, six and five. Six and five. Bottom left, top right, three and twelve, or three and four, four and three. Bottom right, four and four. Okay, any question about getting to this position? Okay, so what is the natural domain? Right. So, so do we? We just have we've got something against negative two, negative three, and negative four. We just don't like them. What, so what's wrong with what's wrong with negative two and negative three and negative four? Right. If you were to attempt to evaluate. Any uh, this expression at negative two or at negative three or at negative four, then there'd be a zero in the denominator and that's undefined. Okay. So the answer to part one. Uh, so I want you to give it to me in interval notation, but to help myself a little bit, I'm going to plot these and make sure that I get it right. So there's three things that are deleted. Four is or negative four is deleted. Negative 3 is deleted, and negative 2 is deleted. So the natural domain looks like this. And which one is furthest to the left? Negative 4. Negative 4. And then negative 3, and then negative 2. So if I was to ask you to give this to me in interval notation, then how would you write it down? Parentheses, yes? To negative four. Very good. Okay, good. So all, all of that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's write it down. 
So um, law four to three union three to the negative two union negative two to infinity. Okay. So notice notice that the drawing has four distinct pieces. One two three four, and also when you write the when you write it in interval notation, it also has four distinct pieces. One, two, three, four. Good. So any question about this? Okay, so as for, as for question two, it said, wants you to simplify by cancellation. So in plain language, can someone say what's being requested? Right. So we're going to use something here we're going to use that the product of fractions product of fractions can be combined into a single fraction what single fraction yes ac over bd okay so i'm going to take i'm going to take this factored expression and i'm going to write which is the product of fractions and I'm going to write it as a single fraction first. So the numerator would be x plus 6, x plus 5, x plus 4, x plus 3. And then divide by x plus 3, x plus 2, x plus 4, x plus 4. So I wrote it as a single fraction. You don't need to do this step, but I always like to write this step when I'm teaching so that everyone's clear exactly what's occurring. So you can think that this, the, all of this up here is just one big combined denominator, and all of this up here is one big combined numerator. So what will cancel? Okay, good. So let's deal with, I'll deal with the numerator ones and the denominator ones. So x plus 6, will anything cancel it? No, so it persists. Okay, x plus 5, will anything cancel it? No, it persists. Okay, um, x plus 4, will anything cancel it? Yes, so it, it does not persist, so it goes away. How about this x plus 3? D does anything cancel it? Yes. yes. Okay, this one. Okay, so that means that this x plus 3 is out. Here's an x plus 2. Uh, and then the x plus 4s were canceled. Right, They're, they were canceled. No, I, I canceled both of them. So I'm, being, I'm being purposefully difficult because someone has this written on their page. Statistically, someone has this written on their page and they think it's right. It's not right. So what's not right about it? Right. This x plus 4 can cancel that one or that one, whichever one. You know, I, this one was kind of more sloppy, so I'm going to say it cancels that one. Okay? But this one persists. Okay, or vice versa. So the most common kind of error on an exercise like this is to, is to think that this one will cancel all of them. How, how, how can we get this one to also be canceled? Yeah, if we had yet another x plus 4 in the numerator. Right. Good. So any question about this one? Okay, another matter because of questions that students coming into my office and asking questions and things like this, I'd like to remind you of the following. That on the previous page, we had this formula, A over B multiplied by C over D is AC over BD. So that's good. The product of fractions can be combined into a single fraction. Uh, and I'm going to, for emphasis, write the dots here. When the dot is omitted, it's understood to be there. Okay, so now I'm going to write something else. So this one's good. So here's something else. 
A over C plus, uh, sorry, A over B. plus C over D. So these are quite similar, at least visually speaking. But what's the distinction between them? Yeah, one of them is product. One of them is sum. So here's something. I'm going to write something that is not correct. So if you're going to write it, then you need to write, you need to note that it is not correct. So if we were to go by the, the formula immediately above, it kind of looks like it would be this. So is that right? No, <laughs> this is not right. Okay. The reason why the formula above is going to be so different, so this is not right. The reason why the formula above works like this in this sort of simple way is because division is the inverse of multiplication. So what, what's happening is you're able to commute the divisions and the multiplications into this other order. That's all that's happening. But there's two operations here. So what does this horizontal line mean? Division. division. And what does this thingy mean? Addition, right? They're different. Addition and division are not, are not compatible in the same way that multiplication and division are. So you've got to do something, something weirder when, you're doing, when you want to do this. So the way this goes, so A over B plus C over D. So who knows the formula? Is it like AZ over BB plus BC over BD? Yes, and it's usually written like this, AD plus BC and then all of this over BD. Okay, so this is the formula. It is referred to as the cross multiplication formula or the butterfly formula. So I'm just, right now I'm copying this formula. So I can make a, so, uh, turn it into a picture. But I want the original formula to be there too, so, so my picture's not all messed up. So, so look at this group, AD, on the, on the right hand side. So I drew a group around AD. Now if I was to draw a group around AD on the left hand side, then the group would look like this. Right? Similarly, if I was to draw a group around BC on the right hand side, so there it is. If I was to draw the same, to do an analogous grouping on the left hand side, it would look like this. For that reason, for this visual reason, that's why this is referred to as the cross multiply formula because the groups form visually crossing like this okay and then your your grade school instructor might have stopped there but if they went further and made a group here for this one for BD and they made a group for that one and did this then some people reckon that this looks like a butterfly so you may know this as the butterfly formula Okay. Now, that being the case, would you please tell me, uh, let's do this, 11 divided by 6 plus, um, how about uh, 19 divided by 30, no, 15, 19 divided by 15. So, I'm going to use the cross multiply formula. Okay, the cross multiply formula is saying that this would be 11 times 15 plus uh, 19 times 6 divided by 6 times 15. Okay, that's just straight, straight plugging it into the formula. So now let's do this arithmetic real quick. So 115, uh, one, 11 times 15 would be 165, uh, and then plus 60 plus 54, 6 times 9 is 54, uh, 100, 
14, is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. You might be surprised just how bad some mathematicians are at arithmetic. Okay, and then 6 times 15, 90. Okay, and then we could simplify this and get uh, what? So that'd be 279 over 90. Okay, terrific. Any question about the use of the butterfly formula? So now I have a question for you. Supposing further that, I, I, I try to never ever ask this, but supposing further that the instruction said, and write your, fra your fraction in reduced form. So is this in reduced form? No, it isn't. Um, what are the numerator and denominator both visible by, divisible by? They're both divisible by three. So the denominator, I claim to all, that all of us can see that the denominator is clearly divisible by three. Because what is 90 over three? 30, right? The numerator, if you don't know the trick, it's sort of, it, it can be difficult to determine if it's divisible by three. So how, how can you immediately tell that 279 is divisible by 3? Well, so does 19. But it's not divisible by 3, yes? Very good. You take the individual digits of the number and you add them all up. So 2 plus 7 is 9 plus 9 is 18. So is 18 divisible by 3? Yes. And notice also that if you add up the digits of 18, what do you get? 9. Is 9 divisible by 3? Yes. So a number is divisible by 3 if and only if the sum of its digits is divisible by 3. So, so you should be able to tell immediately whether or not something is divisible by 3. That's nice. Okay, but who cares? So there's a shorter way, <laughs> there's a shorter way to do this, a slightly shorter way. Uh, because you could, you could fix 11 over 6 and 19 over 15 to have the same denominator, and it could be a little smaller than, than 90. So specifically what I want is I want the smallest number that 6 divides and 15 also divides. 30. And what's the name for the smallest number that both numbers divide? The least, the least common multiple. Okay, so, or... So I'd like to point out that, that we could do the following. I could say this is 11 over 6 plus 19 over 5, 15, I mean to say. And then I'm going to do a little trick here. So this part that I'm writing down, this is not something that you ever write down. This is the, this is the um, procedure that you're going through in your head, is that I want to multiply this by 1, a red 1, and I'm going to multiply this by a, by a green 1. Okay. And then, so the smallest number that, that 6 and 15 both divide is 30. So what would I have to multiply this by to get 30? 5. So that means that I would write 11 over 6, and then I want to write a 5 here. That would be nice. So can I just do that? Just put that 5 there? Why not? Yeah, that's equivalent to multiplying by a fifth. You can't multiply by a fifth. You can't just say, you know, get a paycheck and say, I'm going to multiply that by 10. Right? Wouldn't that be great? So to fix this up, you put a 5 right here also. Okay, so notice that this red 5 over 5, that, that is the red 1, right? The red 1 turned into 5 over 5. Okay, by analogy, by analogy, I'm going to write that this is... 19 over 15, and then what do I need in the denominator of this one? A 2, right? <laughs> Bless you, right? <laughs> and then I need a 2 here also. Okay, and all of this, all of this stuff that I'm writing, this is all stuff that usually occurs in your head when you're comfortable with this technique. So this is all to say that if you do this, ah, we're reckoning 11 over 6 as 55 over 30 and we're reckoning 19 over 15 as 38 over 30. So now they have the same denominator, and then we can add these directly now. So that would be what, 80, 93 over 30. Good. Either one is, is fine.
The second one will be more useful for what we're about to do. Any question about this? Lots of students coming in asking about arithmetic this week. <clears throat> well, actually, that's not what actually happens. Students come in and they say that they have a problem. Now, I can't, I can't figure out what's going on. And in the end, it's arithmetic. OK. <clears throat> so uh, let's have an example. So 6 divide by x squared plus 4x plus 4 minus 2 over x squared minus 4. And by the way, I encourage you to come into my office. Okay? Feel free to come in. I won't bite. And usually, usually I can figure out what, what gap there is in your knowledge quicker than you can. Usually, not always. When is that a good time? Uh, after lecture, like so. I'm gonna go straight there. Okay. Just, just come with me there. A otherwise, send me an email, and I'll be happy to settle a time with you. Okay. So the instruction is. So I'm gonna omit finding the natural domain, but understand that if this was a written exercise, this this would be one of the things I would ask. So how would you do that? Factor it and deal with it and blah, blah, blah. Okay? But we're going to ignore the issue of domain for a minute. And I'm going to say, I want you to, um, I want you to express this as a single, sing, single has an L in it, single, rational expression. Okay, presently this is the difference of two rational expressions. I want you to write it as a single rational expression. So you, you could use the butterfly formula. You could do that, right? You could do that one times that one minus that one times that one and then all over the product. But, but the instru instructions will also say simplify. So the shortest way to go about doing this is to find a common denominator. That's the shortest way. So what should we do? Factor. Okay. So this would be 6 over, and then how does this one factor? x plus 2, x plus 2. And then minus 2. And then how does, how does the one on the right factor? Very good. X plus 2, x minus 2. Okay, so any question about getting to this position? So now, this denominator has an x plus 2 and another x plus 2. This denominator has an x plus 2 and then an x minus 2. So in a sense, what is this one lacking? This one is lacking an x minus 2. And in the same sense, what is this one lacking? Uh, it already has an x plus 2. But it needs another one, right? Because this one has two of them. Exa exactly. So the same trick as before. So, so here's this x plus 2 and this x plus 2. And then you told me that this one is mixed, missing an x minus 2, so I'm, I'm going to put it. Do I just, now what? Must, must also be in the numerator. Because if you just put it in the denominator, you're changing the expression. Okay, so then x minus 2 must also go up here. So this redness that I've put in, that's 1. That's equivalent to 1. Okay? So that means that I multiplied by 1. I, I, therefore, I didn't change anything. Okay, minus. 2 over x plus 2, x minus 2. And then what's this one missing? It's missing an x plus 2. OK, so I'll put it. And then what? We also need an x plus 2 up here. And that green, the green bit, what is that equal to? 
1. Okay, so multiplying by 1, that's not changing the expression. However, notably now, notably, notice that the denominators are the same. Mm -hmm. Now we can subtract them directly. So I'm going to do one little thing. I'm going to say this is not necessary. You wouldn't necessarily have to do this. So 6x minus 12 over x plus 2, x plus 2, x minus 2, and then minus. Uh, did I make an error somewhere? No, it's fine. 2x plus 4, and then <coughs> x plus 2, x plus 2, x minus 2. So all I really did is I multiplied out the numerators, and then I, I put these in the same order. Okay, so now we can subtract. I'm going to do something, so you tell me about it. So 6x minus 12, and then we need to subtract, so minus 2x plus 4, divide by x plus 2, x plus 2, x minus 2. Okay, so how about it? What do you think? Yeah? Very good. Okay, so I've made a I've made a distribution error, or if you like, a parenthesization error. So to get this right, when you perform the addition or subtraction, every time you do something, you need to parenthesize the the thing. So here I'm putting red parentheses. So if the red parentheses were deleted, that wouldn't change anything. So the red parentheses that I just added, they're in a sense superfluous. But these green parentheses that I'm adding they change the meaning. They change the meaning because now it's saying that we're going to subtract 4. Does everybody see the distinction? So, so distribution error or parenthesization error is one of the most common errors that students make in college algebra. Okay, so after this 6x minus 2x, that's 4x. And then 12, uh, negative 12 minus 4 is negative 16. And then if the instruction said factor completely, have we done it? Yeah, you could take out a 4. Okay, good. Any question about this one? Yes? Sure, yeah. So, to, to be clear, I think what you're asking is instead of writing x plus 2, x plus 2, to just to write x plus 2 squared? Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So now we're moving to something completely different. We're in section 2.1, which is called the rectangular coordinate system. I should write that word out at least one time. Coord in it system. So here we go. To now, we've been talking about real numbers. And when we're drawing them, when we're drawing them, uh, we draw them like this. So it's represented as a horizontal vertical line. We almost always single out a point in our drawing, the zero point. Okay, and then the name for when you're wrecking this as, as, a, as an object and looking at it, this position is referred to as the origin. Which is kind of nice and also kind of confu confusing because origin begins with O and zero looks like O. <laughs> okay, so then now, the universal convention in mathematics and all of science, so far as I'm aware, is that when you draw, when you draw a number line, 
uh, the increasing direction is to the right. So that's why I always draw the arrow and pointing on the right hand side. That the arrow indicates the direction of increase. Okay, so this is increasing to the right. Another matter be because of that is that when you, when you draw points on the number line, say like this one and that one, so we've got two points. So A is to the right of B. Uh, yeah, A is to the right of B. A is to the right of B. What does that mean about A and B? Yeah, the fact that A is to the right means that A is bigger. Okay, now, being to the right of zero, being to the right of zero is so significant that that has a name, because being to the right of zero is a little bit clumsy <laughs> to say. What is, it, what is the name that we have for being to the right of zero? Positive. Positive. Right. And what's the name of being to the left of zero? Negative. Negative. Okay, and what is the, what is the, what is the SIGN of zero? doesn't have one. And I'm saying SIGN so you don't think I'm talking about sine and cosine. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then don't worry about it. Okay, so I say S SIGN when I'm talking about positive and negative. So zero has no, no SIGN. Okay, good. So the conceptual, the conceptual device that we use uh, for, for these is that suppose that we, we got another point and we put it, say, right here. And I said, well, what is, what is its value? Well, conceptually, what we have is we get out a ruler, a conceptual ruler, and where we all agree on it. And by ruler, I mean linear measure device, not authoritarian, right? We, got a, we get out a ruler, and it's an agreed upon ruler. We all have the same copy of the ruler, and we can all measure it, okay? And then we say, oh, well, that, that turns out to be, you know, three or whatever. Okay, and because it's to the right of zero, that's positive three. And if we, got, if we got this over here, and I measured that right there, and I said, oh, the, the distance from, from the origin to that point is four. So what is the name for this one? Negative, negative four. Why is it negative four? Because it's to the left of zero. Okay, good. So any question about this? So we have an agreed upon conceptual ruler. So now we're talking about what we will denote as R2. Visually R is depicted as a line. R2 is depicted as a plane. That is to say a flat thing. So let's draw it. So it starts out looking like R, but it's really two copies of R. So we've got a horizontal copy, and we've got a vertical copy. So the horizontal copy, the horizontal copy has the same increasing uh, convention as as the line does. So the horizontal one increases to the right. Notice I haven't indicated the convention for the vertical one. So what is the convention for the vertical? coordinate system. Increases going up. Okay, so it increases going up. Now, in our class that is always the convention that you have when you have a, a, a planar coordinate system that the increasing direction is up. But I need to, because I'm your math instructor, I need to advise you that if you ever take a computer science class the convention will be opposite. That the increasing direction is down if you take a computer science class. The reason is because is because in computer science er, all the time you're interested in you know computer screens and monitors and everything like that. Well, where is the where is the origin of, of pixel coordinates for in the top left, right? So the origin the origin is up here. This is the 00, zero pixel. And then this one is 0 1, 0 2, or sorry. 1 0 2 0 3 0, etc. and then they increase going down. The reason is nothing other than, horse, than 
historical coincidence. Because Hugo Farnsworth, the first person to make a, a CRT, a cathode ray tube, the first screen, when he, when he made it, okay, it, it swept horizontally to the right, starting from the top left, and then down. And so <laughs> the increasing direction is down in computer science. Okay, well, we just have to live with that. Okay, but in, in math, the increasing direction is up. So these two, these two uh, axes, this is a horizontal copy of R, this is a vertical copy of R. They are arranged so that the origin of both occurs right here. So this is also called the origin. And what I mean by that is that the horizontal zero is there and so is the vertical zero. They are both there. Another matter is that notice, so conceptually the line extends infinitely far to the left and to the right, but there's no line up here and there's no line down here. This is the line. The plane conceptually extends infinitely far in all these directions. So this is on the plane. The plane is cut into these four pieces, one, two, three, four, and they are numbered as such. So, th and the pieces are called quadrants. So, quadrants. This one is quadrant one. It's denoted with Roman numeral one. This one with Roman numeral two. This one with Roman numeral three. And this one with Roman numeral four. I personally think that using Roman numerals and even the phrase quadrant is a bit antiquated at this point, so I won't use it. I'm going to say top left and top right, because everybody knows what that means. Okay, but if you, you might read the textbook or something. A guy can dream. Okay. So, <clears throat> so quadrants. Now, if we select a point, if we select a point, on the plane, say this point right here. Then the way that we dealt with that up here is we got out our ruler and we measured the distance to the origin and then we said, if it's on the right side, it's, we'll call it positive three. If it's on the left side, we'll call it negative three. So now we need, we need a, 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 another conceptual system here to do this. And the way that we do it is as follows. So we'll take, we'll take this point right here and we will follow the horizontal axis, or sorry, the vertical axis, down to the horizontal one. So like this, to here, so that we get that point. And we'll do the analogous thing in the other direction. We'll follow the horizontal axis back to the vertical one, and get this point. So that's convenient, because now that we have this point right here, because we have a horizontal copy of R, that means we can get our, our horizontal ruler. We can get it out and we can measure it and say, okay, well, that's the value. By the way, so if we just call this A, so horizontally A, would, would A be positive or negative? Positive. Why would it be positive? Because it's on the right side of the horizontal origin. Okay, and then if we got out our ruler, our vertically oriented ruler, and measured this and found it to be B, would B be positive or negative? Positive. positive. That's because we're positive people. Right? No. Why is it positive? Right. Because it's above the, the vertical origin. Okay. So, that being the case, what is the name of this point then? AB. So, this, this axis is the first axis the horizontal one, and this one the second axis. And that corresponds to the order that these points appear in the name of a point. Okay, so the first, the first measurement appears in the first position, the second measurement in the second position. Okay, now, this axis, the horizontal axis, in in the majority of your prior experience, if you have any, and the majority of stuff that we're going to do in our class, this axis is usually associated with a letter name. What letter? S. Yes, this one is usually called the X axis, and this one, the Y, the y axis. But that is entirely dependent on the problem at hand. However, it is always the case 
that the horizontal axis is the first axis, and the vertical axis is always the second. Good. So any question about this? Is this okay? <clears throat> so let's have an example. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. First question. Please plot the point um, <clears throat> three, two. And then question two. Please find the coordinates of, of, as an F, point B. Okay, and point B, point B is on integer coordinates, right? It's not something like 2.85 or something like that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so plot the point 3, 2. Oh, I'd like to point something out that, that you know, th this, of course, is quite similar to the notation for an open interval. Okay. So you're, that's just an unfortunate, an unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in. So it should be very clear from the context when I write this when it, mean, when it, it is interpreted as a point versus being interpreted as an interval. Okay. So how about the point 3, 2? How do we find it? Start at the origin. Start at the origin. Run to the right. Go to the right. One, two, three. One, two, three. Why am I going to the right? I like going left. What's positive? The three. Okay, good. So I move to the right, three, and then what? North. North. <laughs> okay, then what? One, two. Okay. So this is the point, three, two. Okay, now the inverse question. The inverse question, I want you to find the coordinates of point B. So what are the coordinates of point B? So what is it? Negative two, negative four? Well, hold on just a second. I, the way I did it is I did one, two, three, four, and then one, two. So why is it not four, two? <coughs> I do the x-axis first? Oh, okay. Okay, so it should be one, two, and then one, two, three, four. So it's two, four. Oh, so it's negative two and then four. Okay, thank you. I'm just being difficult to make sure that everybody gets the point. The instruction's clear. Okay, good. So in what quadrant is point B? Three. Quadrant three. Or bottom left, whatever you like. Any question about this? Okay. So now I'm going to raise a question. Before we leave. So here's a coordinate system. I'm only drawing in the top right, so I didn't include the other stuff. It's still there, but I'm just not drawing it. So now, here's a, here's a funny situation we find ourselves in. Here's point A, and here's point B. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I neglected to mention something. What kind of coordinate system is this called? Rectangular. Is that just because rectangles are so cool? Yeah. I mean, that's got to be it, right? It's like calling it a rad coordinate system. <laughs> no. So then it's called a rectangular coordinate system because every point, every point is reckoned as being as the corner of a rectangle. That's why it's called a rectangular coordinate system. 
okay? Now, when we were on the line, when we were on the, the horizontal axis or the vertical axis, if we wanted to find the distance between points, we just get out our ruler, right? But here's part of that, of that, uh, of the conceptual device, is that you have a ruler. If you had two points and they were on the horizontal line, you could measure them, measure their distance. That would be fine. Or you could, if they were, if they were on the vertical one, you can measure the, that distance. So you have a ruler that can do that. But it is absolutely forbidden to turn, that ang the, to turn the ruler at an angle. Forbidden. Yet, I want to know the distance between A and B. And you're absolutely forbidden from turning that, that ruler at an angle. So how are we going to do it? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, this, this A is at the corner of a rectangle, right? It's at the corner of a rectangle. B also is at the corner of a rectangle. And then what we actually want is we want the length of this line. That's what we want. Right, and does everybody see that this is a right triangle? And so now what I'd like to point out is that because these two points are on the horizontal line, you could measure that distance. And because these two, line, these two points are on the vertical line, you can measure that distance. Now, if only we had some kind of formula that related the distance that the size of the legs of the hypotenuse of a right, uh, 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 the size of the legs of a right triangle to its hypotenuse. If only there was some kind of person who thought about that 3,000 years ago. So, so what, what, what was, who, what's the, what's the theorem? The Pythagorean theorem. And that's how we'll derive the distance formula on Monday. So have a nice weekend.